Uh, good evening, uh, or good morning, or good day. I'm going to take a little break uh, from some of the declassified documents, um, but we'll return to them and continue on with that and adding commentary on those things. Uh, this graphic is a, a graphic I've shared in part on various forums uh, over the last year. And it's really just a mind map. Uh, I wouldn't get too lost in trying to sort it out. I'm going to walk through it. I don't have a time frame or a time limit on how long this particular video will be. I'll walk through some of the logic and reasoning that I've applied. Obviously, this is a confabulation. It really is just a memory map or mind map for myself. I consider it a living document in that it can be uh, a sketch or a, uh, an evolving set of notes, uh, both visual and um, contextual. It does incorporate, I think I should say off the bat, we would say religion, philosophy, arts, and chemistry. And I'll uh, show you where that ties in. Up at the top left corner, um, I recently uh, found this this saying, not knowing that it was actually attributed to the Platonic solids or, or the methods of Plato and, and ascribed uh, to the overall mechanics or understandings of uh, the Platonic system. Forms become principles. Principles are extrapolated into laws emotions, beliefs, and understandings. With that, uh, it's my personal position. Uh, it's, it's a position, though, that I, I'm fairly positive when I was about six or seven, maybe ten, could be ten or so, ten or ten years old, I was involved and overheard an argument or a debate. We should call it a debate. Um, between some people who were debating English language or English language. And uh, anyone who's any, you know, inversed or immersed deeply in any sort of historical material, whether it be religious, philosophical, philosophical uh, artistic, or uh, alchemical, might immediately um, think of Anglo Saxon. And that's where I'm going but some of the historical records that I have available to me which is really just um, stuff that I found online um, doesn't really give you a broad perspective on the Anglo-Saxon and I'm not saying Anglo-Saxon Protestants and I'm not saying wasps I'm really talking about a region or a historical time period whereby uh, Ruin, Russian, um, let's say, language of the Angles was being used. Uh, and includes Celtic, Irish, um, and, and sort of my overall belief is that none of the letter forms, if we look back at the Platonic here, uh, the, this, this phrase, that I think it would be oversimplistic to continue thinking that our, our uh, let's just say, ancestors were um, ignorant and really just started crafting letter forms without really any, any meaning, you know. Uh, um, I know that there are many typographers and uh, I don't even know how many uh, studiers call them studiers, academics, professors, uh, many people study language and uh, the entomological origins of words and things like that. But I don't think people have, not to my knowledge, right, I, I mean, I don't know what's going on in college these days or what goes on in the more uh, established or higher, higher learning colleges uh, with regards to, to language arts and the communication arts. But, uh, you know, I, I've done enough research on my own to recognize that, that Nordic ruin, 
They, they all, every line stroke had a specific meaning. And the reason why I call it the language of the angles instead of if some of you are uh, of the Christian persuasion, you know, you, you'll, ref you'll recognize that as language of the angels. And uh, it's, it's my contention, at least for this, this document and this presentation, that it's actually language of the angles. And that's because I think the letters we see and we use, uh, ultimately capital letters mean one thing. And for now, I'm just going to say I think that has to do with man-made law. Again, I know that people have already, uh, there are many masters of that realm who have already stated that that's true in some capacity, but I don't, they're, they're not attributing it to the way or the, the methods that I'm going to go through here. And lowercase letters are sigils. And a lot of those sigils are derived from astron astronomical, biological, and alchemical knowledge. And they all reference, let's say, human biology or natural biology, astronomical knowledge, and uh, material knowledge. And uh, I think even down to the arc or curve in letters and words, the dots, which are called tittles on the uh, tops of I's, lowercase I's, or, or a J. All of those things have specific meaning. And I mentioned typographers before, and, and, and a lot of those people probably are familiar with certain philosophical notions behind those things, and as well as, I don't know, there, there could be tons of papers and research on that stuff. I just haven't been able to access it, and uh, I'm coming at this from a Luddite's perspective, um, but auto as an auto, also as an autodidactic. Uh, I'm going to reference a few existing words that I think are pretty popular in contemporary culture and from a pop culture perspective, and phrases, um, and, and analyze the complete combining of maybe. I don't know, let's just say 10 languages right now, both through accent and how they're pronounced and how they may have been mispronounced or retranslated with characters because of, uh, because of an accent, as well as sigils from other languages um, being incorporated into the English language. This isn't going to necessarily, it shouldn't really reference grammar or, or rhetoric or any of those notions because I think those arts came after the fact where, um, you know, a an, an very, very low level but strong foundation for how I arrived at this stuff. But uh, unfortunately, I'm not ready to present that aspect of it yet, but the, the uh, another very underlining let's just call it, say, a pillar, I'm sure a lot of you would like that, wink, wink, is that language had to have been created both verbally and written in written form after we had some other forms of communication, whether it be art and pictographs, you know, things from the Indus Valley. Um, essentially, it's my my belief will say because that's really what it is I don't have evidence of it and I know a few I've read a few people speculate on various aspects of where I'm going but no one's really come out and just you know put a put a flag in the ground and said I think that early man uh, early human beings must have had a had a, a, at least a little ability with ESP and telepathy whereby we we did operate on herd mentality but that herd mentality was also a hive mentality or a beehive mentality where we could connect more ethereally without the need to document things or write things down. We would have had to have had some sort of extra communication ability or super communication ability. Um, and it's my, my contention that violence or trauma or 
um, the aging population or demographics uh, of those times or say tribes or groups or wandering beings and wandering humans began to record knowledge you know they found value in it you know you have a few cultures and religions that are predominantly supported by uh, word of mouth to one another things are uh, things are passed down uh, verbally they're not always written down and that could be for secrecy that could be to keep the generation moving forward uh, without giving them too much up front because it could be perceived as overwhelming but initially I think that the whole premise and the idea was record keeping and with that record keeping that that need to start to keep records and, and to pass knowledge forward uh, because the population was expanding or because the population was becoming more permanent in its um, endeavor not endeavor but it's it's uh, it's it's last it's, it's permanence uh, you know as knowledge grows you have to start taking notes so people would have had to have had a rationale for why they made characters the way they were and it's if you believe that or even agree with a little bit of what i said it's, it's also likely that you know a letter could be the shape of uh you know loosely be the shape of a natural event like a leaf or um, the hair on a child's head or you know the spiral on a child's head there's definitely that component in here and i think that that has been added or incorporated in some aspects uh, it's just a matter of whittling it out sort of you know pulling out what's related to what contextually and then removing the abstract layer of how we use things now and how easily it can be overlooked or forgotten and supporting the theory that w we were more likely to operate like a school of fish in order for survival than we were to just slowly survive catastrophe after catastrophe and uh, you know and somehow just arrive at creating a book or something or, or writing on tablets or making tools that that's that always seems to be the first thing people say is that we started with tools and I, I don't disagree with that but memory is is a is, is in a very important aspect of any endeavor I mean with anything you have to have memory and if you don't have a good memory you have to have good records and you have to be able to do things efficiently and in a way that other people can pick up on it so <clears throat> excuse me try to keep this first couple of minutes you know don't don't try to hold me too much to the way I'm trying to describe it because this is still a very abstract notion at least for me and I'm having to communicate it with the knowledge that I have and uh, it's not being presented as right or correct or a, a final word I'm presenting it mainly because I think, you know, knowledge needs to be free. Um, access to information and knowledge is very critical. Uh, but at the same time, uh, every idea needs to be sort of vetted across a broad spectrum of potential outcomes and, and results and interpretations from other people. And I, I recognize and you know, have no problems humbling, humbling myself to the fact that there are many knowledgeable people in many aspects of of knowledge and teachings and, and, and mastery and, and things like that so uh, with with religion philosophy arts and chemistry being sort of the the crux and I'm not intending that to be a pun but it is a pun being the crux it's you know it's it's so vast the, the types of things that we can do and we know and how long we've apparently been on the planet and how many books and records exist and how many different languages exist in, in different cultures that uh, this is not to be construed as as an all encompassing presentation for everything it just 
it could literally be related to the Anglo-Saxon, you know, English versus English debate, which I, uh, you know, I have with myself often. And that's how I've arrived at this. This does incorporate what people might consider secret society knowledge. It does incorporate uh, what I call mastery schools instead of mystery schools. Um, I am coming at this contextually with the idea, or, you know, I guess the, the basis of a maker or a creator versus um, an explorer. Those words are going to be, those three words there, maker, creator, and explorer, however, are, are, you know, pole stars throughout this entire process because I think those are the types of people that would have had to have created or at least somehow been able to decipher other language or, or make and unify various types of languages and words and pronunciations and dialects in order to... Uh, keep record keeping and knowledge and memory uh, persistent maybe not consistent because that that'll be clear as I, I start going through some of this stuff but persistent to to keep the ability to transfer knowledge persistent whether it's deliberately coded or codified I don't know uh, in some of the stuff not on this document here it does feel like it's been codified. In other cases, it's it looks like it's been deliberately mistranslated, or or what uh, people on the religious and philosophical philosophical side will say, uh, what's been called redacted or a redactor's notes. Um, but I hope uh, I hope I can get through some of this without being too long-winded. I'm not going to go through it real quick. Generally, I'm a pretty fast reader, a speed reader. But I am articulating something here to whomever listens or watches without, uh, it's not that it hasn't been refined, it's just that it touches on so many various different knowledge sets and skill sets that I, one, want to you know, present it in a way that's not offensive so, and uh, to keep people interested, at least in so much as that if someone can immediately spot a fallacy or something that I present is so... Uh, so concise and clear in its presentation that someone can immediately rebuke it with something proper or, or more likely to correct it or you know present something that will dissuade me from even going in that direction because it just seems so obtuse and then also uh, for the people who do have knowledge sets and, and skills in these sort of uh, different categories that I go through being religion philosophy arts and chemistry that those people are able to understand where I'm coming from and, and what I'm trying to talk about and convey. So just hold in the back of your head language of the angles, not angels, and this is not an insult. It's just, uh, it's, it's not meant to relinquish the power of your religion um, or anyone else's for that matter. And English and English are those things just hold those in the back of your head here and then while you're looking through it just always kind of come back to this here because I, I think that this is critical I'm not putting everything I believe into this here but this was so succinct that I, I had to uh, attach it and then there's just my notes below it right here which is look at the words listen to their pronunciation consider accents of those times and how people probably did a lot of lip reading as well um, you know and mistranslating words because of accents and uh, give the letter forms intention and reason let's not just consider them to be embellishment or uh, decorative I, I, I don't think they are at all and um, Again, there's, there's no, if my voice and tones a specific emotion or feeling, it's not deliberate. Uh, it, it's hard to be interesting without being monotone. And, uh, you know, I have to think before I speak, not because it, it, I, I don't know what I want to talk about. It's because there, there's just so many different lines I'm crossing here for many people that 
have such stringent belief systems and value in what they believe that uh, you know I, no one wants to be offended and no one wants to present anything that's going to offend anybody. Uh, knowledge is to be respected and uh, so our belief systems because right now like I said this is just a belief system of English over English and um, really dissecting at least giving our, our ancestors credit for being much more attenuated to what they want to do and communicate versus uh, you know necessity being a part of form and function not um, embellishment and decoration so uh, right here we've got start here and that's where I'm going to start for now it's fairly common for people to reference a notable I and J and L switch in a lot of ancient texts including Roman, Greek um, and uh, what else Christian uh, and even in some cases Arabic where characters were either deliberately codified where an I was given a, a curl at the bottom to make it a J but um, just to walk people through this you know there's the IU Peter which uh, I think someone like Jordan Maxwell who happens to be well known and uh, I'm insulted I don't remember his name we'll just call him Willie you guys should all know who Willie is if you're familiar with any of this stuff um, have all said that Jupiter and Saturn and, and all those things are, are, are type of Kabbalah or somehow wrapped around some sort of religious notion or belief system. It could be true. I think Jordan Maxwell has specifically said that IU Peter is the same as Jupiter. And for me, I don't recall if I've actually heard him say that or read anywhere that he's written that. I'm just attributing that to him here. Um, but it may have been something I put together. And then further down, we have Jupiter, Lucifer. And what I think has happened is things like this, where the F and the T have just been sort of, if you look at this, this has been mirrored. Right, the T and the F have just been flipped and mirrored. I think that our coders and our redactors, whether we call them the Catholic priests or the Christian priests or the Romans or whoever we might want to blame, uh, you know, there's no blame here. We're just I'm just looking to identify the phenomena itself. Um, I, you know, the J and the L could have been flipped. I, I think this is the type of code we should be looking for in the texts. And in our documents and our ancestors and masters texts uh, for me lucidity is a derivative of lucifer not because of anything related to the character sets but because of the the uh, lucy that's a, that's a common one people have uh, sort of attributed uh, Satanism to and, and everything like that. But for me, what I see here is the, the, the old reference from Masonic texts of the light bearers, light bearing. Uh, most Christians will agree that Lucifer and Satan are not the same thing. However, they will say that they're both demonic or, or related to hell. I don't agree with that. I think that's most likely a result of um, the Catholics, the Catholic churches, or we should say Roman Catholic Church. Again, no offense to anybody. I'm just, I just have to use terms that I hear reiterated because we don't know who to blame, and we're not trying to blame anybody. But these are just labels, not blaming mechanisms. You know, I, I, most people recognize or remember that the the Catholic Church did outlaw reading and writing and learning for a long time, and lucidity for me, and I think in, in various interpretations of the word and its definition, is, is, a, is, a, is a clear understanding of something. It's like, it, it, it's synonymous with epiphany, cognizance, 
uh, letting a little light into your your ideas and your brain I think that those the, the, there's a correlation there and then we have lucid which interestingly enough is a anagram of Euclid and Euclidean geometry being um, one of the most important things that we use today uh, for all kinds of uh, I mean it's almost involved in everything that's in some fashion or another someone's had to, to crunch out some geometry the character letter of the E uh, I have not, you know, I, I've done research on F's, L's, D's, I's, C's, R's, E's. Uh, you know, the E isn't actually, for me, is this character here. You guys should recognize what that is. The A, the Aether. That is a, uh, in my interpretation, is a, a variation of any more and evermore, which looks identical to infinity, infinity symbol. It also looks like the Egyptian Ankh, or a variation of the Ankh, which is the mother egg, um, the sun or the moon on the horizon, things like that. Those have all characteristically been attributed to those that that line work and those letters. And I think that we have to we have to get to that point where we're starting to look at these things on a, on a you know in a multi-dimensional way. The E. The only thing I've ever really gotten far to or gotten far with conceptually is, is to just break down each stroke. And I've done that on other documents. Again, I'm not going to go into that just yet because this primer sort of this document as a primer is more important than each individual letter. And, uh, you know, I could go on for two or three hours, which it might very well happen. But uh, what I did is just broke the strokes up and it has, uh, you know, it makes a cube. And that's all I did is I, I just took each stroke off because that's how I come to the um, conclusion of English and English where, you know, this arc, that arc, or this crest line, this crest line, this crest line, this crest line, they all mean something. And we know that in runic, that's the case actually. Now, the way it's defined is it's usually defined against a biological or natural phenomenon. For example, the F for father is really an L, and the L, that means you have a son, or a child, rather. That when you add that stroke there, like that, that, that's to insinuate that the man with his extended penis, which is this, has now has a child. And then we flip that around and we get an F. So I think, for me, that's pretty obvious. The mirror world and uh, the the Michelangelo and Cezans and the, uh, the Da Vinci's the those codifications are important, but I think we have to take it down to the micro level as well as the macro level. And in this case, each letter has been codified in a specific way. You know, right here with this T and this F, and just redactors went through text and but and then mirrored it. So we got Jupiter. So we basically hid Jupiter worship, or Jupiter worship was turned into a villain and made into Lucifer, or Euclid was somehow transferred into lucidity. It, it's all in there. Uh, I don't think I need to make, I don't think it takes a large leap of understanding to see where I'm going with that. Uh, if this was a Jordan Maxwell thing, I think that's that's enough for someone to, just from the phonetical uh, pronunciation of it, IU Peter and Jupiter. Uh, you know, it, it's it's Jupiter. It's it's pretty easy. Now, I'm not saying Jupiter was bad, or I'm not saying Lucifer is good, or anything like that. I'm just really analyzing the letter forms and the forms becomes principles the principles are extrapolated into laws emotions beliefs and understandings and then i'm looking at the words listening to their pronunciations considering accents and translations and then looking at the letter forms where they originated from and then just giving credit to the masters and saying you know there had to be a reason for all this stuff here i'm going to jump away from this section and come up here because i think this is another interesting uh, aspect of the research 
that I'm sort of going through and that's right here northern southern western eastern um, I, I think it's pretty I, I, I'm gonna read these out but uh, I'll let this sit with you everyone visually if they're watching or listening uh, and just a little story to support this sort of how I arrived at this conclusion I think explorers as I mentioned before that those three groups of people most of the text that we have most of the knowledge and the need for keeping knowledge persistent I think is also ascribed to the the ability of man to persistently remain in one place and and learn things and a lot of those texts whether they be religious, philosophical, alchemical, uh, Masonic, uh, you know, whatever. They always seem to come from people who have lived in high lands or lands with, that aren't necessarily surrounded by water, but you know, they're not water-bearing cultures to begin with. They're not water-traveling. And it's, it's precarious to me that we don't, I think the only... I think the most well-known traveler, explorer, warrior, um, healer, philosopher uh, would be Jason and the Argonauts. And it's pretty interesting, you know, we have Jason. I'm just going to put that there. There's not a lot of famous Jasons. I think there's a Jason that's considered a healer in biblical texts. And that Jason, who's the healer, would have been, if we uh, consider the Homeric text, you know, Jason and the Argonauts, uh, Jason would have been, I think it's the best friend or the brother of Apollo. And Apollo and Jason were students of Asclepius, uh, I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, I apologize, Asclepius, who uh, was a famous healer and basically the, uh, the person given credit for modern medicine. And um, there's not a lot of explorers. Most of the things related to explorers is wrapped around the hero's journey, which is a literary device and um, if you've done a lot of art study and a lot of history uh, whether through school college or, or on your own or maybe you have private you know private instructions and stuff or even your own records your own families keep records <coughs> excuse me you know that most explorers are turned into adventurers now they don't care about anything there's not a lot of need for permanence there's you know they're often uh, whimsical and, and other times aloof and it's just all about the journey and all about the adventure but we actually do have explorers seeking to keep their knowledge permanent or persistent and those records are in the form of maps we just don't uh, I don't think a lot of people just make that don't don't make that correlation that there may not be a 300 page document or a book or a scroll because one, if you're on a boat or you're traveling from place to place, you try to usually keep it light. And uh, if anybody's ever lived on the water or near the water, <clears throat> you know that salt water will pretty much destroy anything after a given amount of time. It's, uh, it's, it's, not, a, it's not really an easy life to live, uh, even, you know, even if you're a captain of a ship with multiple hands on deck and, and things like that you don't maps are probably most likely the the originator of iconography right uh, where it became literalisms and in some cases there were subtle codes used but uh, you know iconography and art I would think not symbols but iconography and art wayfinding visuals they're basically wayfinding visuals that reference points with very literal um, drawings explorers sort of legacy and, and what they've left behind would be maps and with those maps um, you know 
there's the ever-present compass and then we have the compass and the square which uh, is attributed to the Masonic uh, history and we'll get to that down here in a, in a, in a few minutes but this is, is where I'm sticking so try to stay with me I'm gonna you know there's a lot of tangents to go through hopefully you know I can I can keep you focused long enough um, before shutting this off so uh, here again I went just with accents and dialects and uh, you know I found an interesting word buried in between southern which would be Uther and I know that a lot of people are told that the the legend of King Arthur and the, even Uther themselves is a myth however I don't agree I've my own research has led me to believe that there was someone whether or not Arthur existed there was an Uther the Pendragon moniker is real as well um, so when I looked at this from an explorer's perspective and the most acclaimed explorers being those who traveled by ship or boat um, it, it stern I mean it's, it's pretty obvious to me stern would have been uh, I don't have a Wacom tablet guys so I'm having to do this with a mouse but it's interesting that a stern also really looks like an astrological guide as well it also looks like something that would uh, correspond with the lunar and solar cycles and star maps um, I think that's a pretty obvious symbol for people who are versed in, in any sort of uh, mariner, sailor, uh, shipping, commerce, uh, history, or families. And uh, we have North Stern, which if we add an accent to it, we've got Norse Stern. South Stern would have been Uther Pendragon or perhaps Angland. West Stern would have been, could have been Welsh Stern. And Eastern, I think, is Ezines or Asian Stern. East Stern. I think Ezine or Nazarenes would have been how we were labeling that knowledge as it relates whenever these words were used or sort of invented. We would have referenced. It might have been called Persian mystics, but if you've done a lot of research into the, the basic Christo, you know, Judo-Christian um, texts, you should be surprised at either how Persia and, and Asia are treated, if mentioned at all. If mentioned at all. They're very rarely mentioned. However, if you look at some of the ancient art or old art, from Japan and Asia there are depictions of for now I'll just call them Christic Christic figures and uh, we know that that Hinduism and, and uh, Abrahamism and Brahma Abraham Brahman it's kind of in the word itself Brahma uh, somewhere along the lines those things have been combined and could have been an attempt to make a unified religion which we hear often through uh, the Roman Catholic Church and, and Rome's supposed amazing ability to or endeavor to uh, make one re religion that encompassed all religions which is a pretty monumental task but in doing that you would have to erase people's minds erase their histories and hope or just hope that people forget um, so I, I thought this was interesting and it's it's you know I'm pretty confident in at least recognizing that north south west and east are translations of other words uh, I would I put a little money on north stern south stern western eastern uh, I'm not afraid to do that as far as it being Norse stern or in relation to England, as in Uther Pendragon, or Welsh Stern, or 
Eisenstern from Ezine, Eisenstern. Um, that's that's a little you know uh, I'd put money on it too, just probably a little bit less. I'd have to have have two hands on the on the blackjack table there, if that was the case. But then I, I have this line here that it makes sense that a powerful navy or a well-versed group of explorers would put itself at the center of the world. So for me, I was kind of like, where is the center? Where you know, I looked at the map and I looked at Norse, Nor, uh, you know, Norway and Iceland and uh, Norwegian and uh, you know, those are also in Russian history. A lot of that stuff has been fudged and and conquered and decimated and rebuilt over and stuff by the Catholic Church and the Roman Catholic Church as well. But you don't hear a lot of reference to any of those areas. It's always usually the Middle East. Everything is the Middle East. It's always the Middle East. And uh, uh, there's no Asia. There's no Persia. There's there's none of that ever. It's just the Middle East. Everything's from the Middle East. And uh, for a place that was supposedly a desert, people then hang their hats on uh, you know, Egypt and uh, Syria and Iran. I think enough historians will will know that Iran is just a variation of Iran, and that there were a lot of white uh, Iranians, and there still are. So, um, and historically speaking, we're generally given this real linear, perfectly plotted timeline of, of how history changed hands. And that doesn't really make sense because we know nothing happens in a day unless you force it to happen. Um, and th there's just too much history. There's too much of a perfect timeline. Even if you say there's gaps here, we're missing 300 years here, we're missing, it doesn't matter. It's just, it somehow is laid out in such a perfect linear way, yet where <clears throat> we're often told that the Vikings were sort of not that smart or uh, were basically conquerors and brutes and we're, we're told Asia wasn't really much of anything. It was mongrels and, you know, it's a very isolated way of looking at things, I think. And it, it does put the Middle East at the center, yet it's called the Middle East. So when I say who would put themselves at the center... It, to me, it's, it's, it's Britain or Britannia, which basically has verified connections to Sumerian cultures in Britain. So, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's very precarious. And then I, uh, so what I do from here is that I conceptually take this plot course, plot land, and maritime law. I take it now from the, the codification of the words and I go back to symbolism and, and how letter forms are constructed and uh, th this kind of switching here. What I'm basically looking at constantly and sort of always stuck in is how just how often this symbol is used in some way or another. A stern the sacred cross, uh, the bind in the circle from, say, witchcraft, uh, the actual runic letter reforms, which could all be derived, right? Here's our R. It's all on this. So I think for me, this is a codis. Now, I recognize the arcs and stuff like that aren't being translated uh, in ruin, but um, I'll, I'll get to that potentially in another video. So I'll, let's just leave that there, put that on pause, and then let's come back here to Euclid. These time frames are, are you know, I'm not, I'm not claiming any sort of order because I think that's wrong to do. I don't know what appeared first or who appeared first and honestly if you're being un you know being unbiased and objective you don't need the time frames right now you're just really looking at the pockets of of uh, corollary, corollary correlating elements that may or may not be ancillary to one another and, and this is actually interesting here because we look at Arabic language and Thai um, 
think it's uh, Tamilin, I think it's called. And they're, they're very beautiful languages. You know, they're, they're so articulate. Or I think it's Astromavi. You know, they have these, these beautiful, if you didn't know any better, you would think it was an art form. But uh, they all incorporate curvatures in their letter forms. So we may have, in our attempt to make the English language a universal language or uh, something, whatever, uh, we began to incorporate arcs and curves. But let's go back to this here. The founder of geometry. Uh, meter is a, uh, is a Masonic term, Masonic symbol. symbol. We know that the, the square and compass are tools and symbols that are, you know, if I, they may even be trademarked, I don't know, uh, under the Masonic orders and, and uh, things like that. However, that one symbol that let's just call it the square, or originally what it was called by the Phoenicians and the Egyptians is a gimel. Now with just that little line right here, just this ability to do this, to say take one line and take another line and, and use them. If we were to make a tool, say you had two chopsticks. Let's bring our Asian friends in here because a pair of chopsticks is a pretty, pretty powerful tool. Um, you can basically measure time, you can measure space, and you can measure distance. You have the rule, uh, a common phrase, which is the rule of thumb. And the rule of thumb basically means you're using your thumb to measure something. And I'm sure that was a, uh, a common practice for a long time. And I go back to, now I jump back to the, some of the stuff I said earlier about the Neanderthal man. You know, we're always told tools were the most important thing, the first thing they did. Well, I, I doubt that. I, I think the human hand and the human body would have been the metric or form of measurement that everything was gate that was built upon first before tools came into play i think that makes sense you know we have a foot we still use feet right now we still use the term we may not be using um you know obviously everyone's a different size and, and weight and height but we still use that term it's a foot and the inch is most likely predicated off of the thumb and uh, we, we have to, I think we have to take that into consideration. So, and this stance I think is interesting because uh, stance is greater to equal to stand. So when we say distance, it's, it's the space between two things, right? Where one thing stands and another thing is being connected to it. And we're making, uh, you know, we're, we're basically measuring a space. And this shape is literally the cornerstone or another Masonic term, the foundation, right? Because we know what the foundation block is in, in architectural and engineering terms. Um, <clears throat> but more conceptually, I think it's, it's interesting just all this stuff here, just with that line work. And that line work is going to be translated over here. You should be picking up on where I'm going with this, that there is, in fact, a principles extrapolated into laws, forms become principles, and that the first tool wasn't paper and pen. It could have been a stick or a twig and uh, people drawing in the sand. And then from there, necessity derived more lasting record keeping and perhaps paper and rock and etching and things like that. But we just have to kind of fill in the blanks conceptually here. And uh, I think going into more Masonic history, perhaps we have reference to the Templars um, and that can easily be extrapolated from any of our geometric shapes. There's a lot of people who have already done the artwork and shown how the uh, Maltese cross, the uh, German cross, uh, the Iron Cross, all of the Templar cross, the Star of David, uh, the Christian cross, all of that can be just using a, a uh, compass 
can all be extrapolated in perfect proportions from these three lines. And I say three because the circle is one continuous line. Then we have a horizontal and a vertical. If you put your compass in the center here, your, um, yeah, I think I locked my layer here. If you put your compass in the center, you're gonna, you're gonna be able to draw out and figure out all of the actual shapes that we have. The fact that they're not perfectly represented on rock carvings shouldn't matter because we do have manuscripts uh, where artwork, you know, things like the Book of Kells. I mean, the, the amount of ge geometry, whether you call it geometry or not, but the ability to remember where you started and where you were going on just your line work those intricate patterns the uh, celtic art and the irish art and, um, and then we look at arabic art and um, indian art and, and the all uh, the patterns will either mesmerize you and you'll get lost in producing them or you're going to make tools and make things that help you remember where you started so that you can finish something and uh, you know make it easily repeatable the next time even if you know when i say easily repeatable i don't mean the next day you're doing it i mean yeah it took you a month to make something or two months or 10 years or whatever it is but uh I, again persistence of that knowledge would have had to have depended on tools and memory not just uh you know we didn't just arrive to this perfect record keeping method so conceptually we have all this stuff in my mind accounted for in terms of these just two lines two lines chopsticks let's just call them chopsticks and with with a pair of chopsticks depending on how I I use them I could use that as a compass right uh, I could use them as a measuring stick or a meter meter stick and uh, work my way around it that way and with that let's just quickly jump into this so geometry or geometer, uh, binding distances, that's all we're doing here is binding a distance. You know, I, I consider it something like a, a, a man sort of hanging out on an endless plot of land and uh, he takes his cane or his meter stick or his gimel and he sticks it in the ground ties a string to it, puts a rock on it, and then just walks around the base of that and makes a perfect circle. Now, before we had record keeping, we had devices. I don't want to say tools yet, but let's just call it a device. Let's not uh, isolate it too much, but binding a distance, binding time, uh, being able to make something out of nothing is essentially what gives us this sort of uh, higher philosoph philosophical thought here. And that in turn gave us this because the gimel or the compass and square is exactly the same device that uh, mariners use to plot courses on maps. Pretty profound tool found tool basically made of two sticks two straight lines two straight edges um, so now I have to go back to the phonetics and the sounds and the accents and I uh, you know uh, uh, my deeper sort of foundation on all this being English not English which really puts English or English as a root language, you know, next to something like what people might cons consider Hebrew to be. Or it is, in fact, the newest language, one of the newer languages on the block, so to speak. However, it's so cleverly designed that it incorporates all aspects of, um, you know, philosophy, religion, and art. Uh, it's 
I'm not trying to pinpoint it on the map. I'm just trying to show that an island of thought exists with what I'm talking about. It's highly conceptual stuff. So if I say Mithra, Measure, and Magi, these two for me, if I were from a different land, Measure and Magi, I think they're almost the same thing. I think if I were a high religious, religious person in those times and a dedicated religious person with my belief system and I was already being told that reading and writing and tools and things of those nature were dark arts and the, the ability to communicate with sigils and uh, magic symbols that made people smart or made them know things without ever being told words. You know, I could just show somebody a symbol and they knew what to do right away. Or they acted in a weird way that I was not familiar with. Um, for me, there's, it's a pretty simple correlation to make. I think measurers are the same as magicians. Um, and then we take it a little bit further with, uh, you know, like I showed the man trying to plot land and, and figuring out how to divine land or divide land language of the angles so Mithraism I know from an, uh, a Persian and Arabic standpoint has roots with astronomy and solar and lunar cycles as well as the um, reproductive cycle I I think measuring things is probably the most profound thing we've we've been able to do, period. I think uh, that's where mostly all of our knowledge comes from. And it's most likely because of the result of a cane. I mean, that's all you needed was a cane. You really just needed one straight stick. And with that stick, you can do your yard, your foot, your, your, your perfect circle, your... Um, you know, find the mean, if you will, or the meaning. I think all of our language is sort of jumbled up where we have these words in the dictionary that have six or seven different meanings, and that's a reason. There's a reason why a word might have three or four definitions, and it's because we have to look at how it's used in the context of um, our greatest endeavors as a, uh, as a race, which is religion, philosophy, the arts, and chemistry. And we have to always sort of um, keep that in mind when we're looking at rules. Again, rules, right? Look at that, that word, ruler. You have a ruler and you have a ruler. You have laws that are governed by rules. And uh, we have math and principles which are governed by rulers. I, I think it's just too simple of a correlation um, to ignore, and I like I like again we're just we're just kind of sticking to this. The the, the man-made laws <clears throat> would have been derived from both a biological principle and a religious principle, and uh, my understanding of all that stuff is that uh, just law itself is that there's two aspects of it, which is interesting because there's always there's two points on all this stuff here. And the one is, is that anything you do to nature has a lasting impact on it, and thereby laws are derived from that. And anything you do to another person has a lasting impact on them. And that is how, that's where sort of everything matriculates from. And I use matriculate specifically because that's very close to metric or measure. But matriculate means something different in relationship to law or the spreading of information but it's the same word it's it's literally pronounced almost identically so we have meter matriculate mithra measure magi um, the language of the angles the great divider or the great diviner it's possible the right devil could have been an extrapolation of divide, um, deviling. I, I, there's, there's some interesting words from <clears throat> Germanic and Ottoman, say, fairy tales, devilish, uh, even Italian, right? Uh, 
not Diablo, but I want to talk about uh, scribbling and scratching. and uh, Those words, to me, actually have a little bit of a negative connotation, and I think that we have a, a little bit of a lexicon or, or colloquialisms from still used today all, by all of us without the same intentions that were imbued in those words when I'm about to apply where they come from. But the if we're going to outlaw reading and writing and we don't know how, I don't know I don't know personally how long that was that lasted but if we're going to outlaw the arts you're going to come up with a new way of describing the arts that doesn't reference their actual meaning to keep people from looking further right you're going to recodify those words whether deliberately or not but you're going to come up with scribbles and scratches and he's possessed and uh, he does the devilish, you know, deviling marks and scratch, right? Scratch that old, scratch is actually a, a reference to the devil, scratch that old devil. Um, people deviling their hands, uh, fidgeting, doing things and scribbling. We're always given this contemporary, we're shown those cut types of imagery in horror movies and movies centered around Satan and all this other stuff. And it's presented in a negative context, but I, I think we have to look at that that with a lens of, of just a time period when what, what might most likely might be the medieval times. Um, could be, I guess, but uh, I'm sure a lot of you out there, if this, this video gets any traction anywhere, uh, will be able to correct me. But uh, I think there's a lot to be said for that. That scratching and scratch and all that stuff was a negative connotation given to people who, who still knew the arts or were passing the arts on or people who were just maybe compelled to like express themselves and because they couldn't um you know they couldn't use the words they wanted to use they couldn't use the art they wanted to use uh we come up with these symbols and i wouldn't you know i wouldn't doubt that these symbols while they're while they're found in caves and stuff we're always told they're found in caves and all this other stuff. I mean, I, I look at some of the, the ruins and, you know, where they say they're found, you know, in these lost cities, and they look like prisons to me. They look like they were old mass prisons where people were put and watched and left and uh, without much to do, they they communicated the best way they could with with blood on the wall or you know dyes or whatever whatever they were doing but i i they, these don't look like homes to me they, they look too small and they say and i i've heard people say well they were they were uh, herding pens or, or pens for food and storage and all that and I, it i i think we're, we're glossing over some pretty drastic time periods in our history supposedly you know, if you're going to outlaw reading and writing and not know how long that actually lasted, uh, which I've never really heard it put into a, a, a timeline or a box, uh, we do have reference to the medieval times often, but it's really, we're told we don't know much about it. There's not a lot of records from it. And then you tell me there's the Catholic Church and the Roman Catholic Church or whatever outlaws reading and writing. Well, I mean, it, it, there's a parallel there. There, there, there has to be. So uh, whatever, whatever catalyst occurred, I, I think we have to reevaluate those things a little bit, at least in my perspective. I do. I'm going to. You don't have to. I'm going to. And uh, if other people want to, that's great. But from what I can surmise and sort of through my own personal insight, and I'm using that word loosely, I know I do uh, recently have published videos on telepathy and ESP. Um, I'm not saying I'm using any of that. I'm just using insight, intuition, and a little bit of instinct. I'm placing myself in these situations in order to further understand. In my own head, I'm placing myself in these, these memory rooms, which is a Roman term, uh, in order to figure out what I might do in that situation if I were not allowed to read or write. And then I'm looking at the actual forms of these, these caverns and these, these massive structures on the sides of walls 
that looked like one or two people could stay in the cave the entire time. Now, I get that there was also a very religious component to the what might be called the initiates in right in learning these masterful arts and these sacred arts, which I think we all take for granted for. I mean, before people could tell time or measure time or measure space or measure distance or you know, build a house for someone else, right? Or build a piece of furniture for someone else. These, these things would have had to have appeared magical to other people or, or counting or math or being able to divide up sheep and then monetary and money and all this stuff. It, it's gonna seem pretty whimsical and magical to someone like a Luddite or a serf. Uh, so, you know, kind of jumping back into the graph, graphic here, we're binding distance and time on a geographical plane. That's it. We're, we're, we're standing in the middle, throwing our rock out, walking along that rock and getting a perfect circle without any math or any rulers or anything like that. Literally just a device made from a stick, a string, and a rock, which if, if we skip metallurgy and we skip the iron, the, these terms that we use, the Iron Age and the Silver Age and the Bronze Age, Bronze Age, which seems just very convenient, if we just skip those terms for a little while, and really, I mean, just place ourselves in that situation. If you're, any, if you're anybody who's had to camp, go camping, or spend a lot of times outdoors, I mean, you can make a lot of things with just sticks, rocks, and bones. I mean, you, you can make, the reason why we can make a lot of things now is because most of us have familiarity with a device or two where we just kind of replicate that device with the sticks and stones and stuff. But uh, before there were, urns and furnaces and, and the mastery over fire and heat which would have really been alchemical knowledge or a, a version of it we would have had tool making which is supporting the the, the overall theory that we hear from people uh, academics and, and what's recorded in books and, and literature but I think everyone ascribes tool making to technology where it's not technology it's it's just repurposing the elements of nature to help us uh, configure the world, right? Configure, refigure, and figure out. Those are all, in my mind, derivatives of art or Masonic knowledge. Um, <clears throat> so... We have making things and no unknowable things by waving your wand around. And your wand could have been that cane. It could have been a pair of chopsticks. It could have been any number of things. Um, but they're not technology. They were just devices that were objects from nature repurposed for mechanical measure and mechanical means, giving us meaning, giving us the middle of something, the division of something. If you, if you can divide a space, you can divide land, you can divide time. Now you have this quantitative and qualitative ability and you can start to assign substance to things. You know, land becomes property, uh, a path becomes repeatable, you know, a distance no longer seems endless or or any of that stuff we have persistence and permanence now with with just these simple devices uh, let me just take a pause here and, and look where I want to take everybody uh, if you're watching here I just want to step out um, <clears throat> excuse me let me just take a drink this stuff here is uh, actually let's just do it this way I mean I, if, if you've grasped any of the concepts that I've tried to communicate here I think this stuff makes sense here we have math which is the divine or the divide the language of the angles and being a magi who can measure using geometry geometering right geo metering in the middle it's pretty simple Uh, the one and the zero um, is interestingly, I think, also tied to Isis and Osiris. So uh, if that's the case, 
English or Anglish has to be a very old type of language. It has to be, or we have all of these English words or English translations of existing words, which then makes English a new language devised or divined to be the global language, right? the universal language, you know, which sort of falls in line with the, the goals of the Catholic Church to have a universal religion. Uh, some of our most broadest concepts astrologically and biologically, right? We have a, a, the male and the female. We have a 3D access point. Um, <clears throat> let's see, we got uh, a line of sight. We have perspective. All of these things can be done and communicated broadly with almost the same two shapes, just repeated, turned, twisted. And I find that to be remarkable and notable and worth uh, you know, further explanation, or exploration, at least by me. I'm not going to get too much into this stuff because it's going to sound like witchcraft, but w witchcraft to me is... Uh, everybody automatically goes to pop culture with with potion making and all this other stuff but uh, I mean if you're someone who likes food and you've ever tried to cook a meal or you have mem recipes that you've memorized either yourself or, or recipes that you've created yourself or recipes that you love and you've mesmerized or memorized it's uh, I mean isn't cooking the greatest form of alchemy known on, on by everybody simplistically it's it's heating and cooling and cutting and chopping and combining and reducing and mixing again and recomposing and and uh, you know it, it, it it's every aspect of it's almost every aspect of alchemy so food you know alchemy cooking it, I mean, is cooking older than language? It's it, I don't know. I, you know. You know where I'm going with that? Like, what's what's older, right? Our belly or our brain? Uh, you know, wh where's that going? But uh, I, I don't like using witchcraft. It's just I think that the the idea of the word craft, to me, has whether you use the K or the C. You know, the K R A F T or C R A F T. The K being an interesting letter when you really start to study uh, the, the sigils and characters we use. But um, there's too much hocus pocus ascribed to that word. And through uh, uh, almost every, every known philosophical religion that's related to either a divinity or ascension or uh, some sort of... Um, uh, maker or creator right those three words maker creator explorer is um, has in it a set of characters who are responsible for teaching language and writing so and they're always female almost all of them are all female so it's possible that the feminine again through this either this crazy medieval slash ban all language and reading and thought stuff uh, you know uh, uh, the, the, the notion of, of people getting a full belly off of a delicious meal and having euphoria off of it working the same as a potion or you know pharmaceuticals whatever you want to however you want to I mean f good food is a pharmaceutical it's, it's, a, it's a drug anybody who's been starving on sea or traveled a long distance or I mean you, you eat a good meal it really it's it's the only true time you actually get to taste all the flavors and what you're eating because nowadays a lot of people can just go get what they want right away and there's no real acknowledgement of how the craft behind making that food good and you're so used to eating good food that you, you don't really process the salt the pepper the burn the crisp the 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 seasonings here the 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 texture, the, dex the dexterity required to make this food look the way it does, um, that's all lost. So there's something to be said in there for our translations. 
and how that's that's been sort of overlayered as this crazy lady who uh, scribbled on the walls and kept jars full of herbs and, and all this other stuff. But, uh, you know, uh, it's just, it's just, it's, it's a lot of nonsense, at least in my interpretation. <clears throat> Not to say that there weren't people doing bad things with their knowledge and their skills or with these uh, arts. Of course there were, but there, I mean, that, that could be said with any endeavor. There's always someone who's going to exploit, exploit something for their own benefit. How it's been transformed now and turned into this grandiose myth of um, supernatural proportions, uh, I think that's, that's really a disservice to our knowledge and our ancestors and the masters who have left us so much uh, in the wake of their uh, endeavors and discoveries. So, let me see where we're at here, 109, so was that 40 minutes, I think? This is going to be controversial here, this side. Uh, I, I don't know if I should get into it just yet. Actually, it's possible I should give everybody a break um, and come back and do another video. Let's just say, <clears throat> maybe to entice you, to provoke you, or um, maybe to to have you never return to this video again, um, deter you. Look at the words, listen to the pronunciation, consider accents and consider letter forms, imbue intention and reason. And then of course remember, forms become principles. Principles are extrapolated into laws, emotions, beliefs, and understandings. I'm gonna take my religion, philosophy, art, and chemistry as a foundational mechanism that has propelled us forward day in and day out for however long we've been able to measure our history and time and record it. I'll get into this later, but uh, uh, I'm pretty confident in this, this, and this. That I think crest, Christ, crystal, cross line, crystalline, Christ line. I think those are so obvious to me. Uh, and it's only because I really do respect all the different things that I'm trying to uh, conceptually tie together. I mean, it doesn't matter what, if you believe in Judaism or believe in uh, Islam or you're a Buddhist or you, you like Christianity or you don't like Christianity, it doesn't matter. That, 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 that's not the point of any of this. It's just to show that there's just too many connections. Again, if, if this is, if, if we're looking at the ancient texts of masters, you know, which, which is all we really have, that's what everybody's going off of, is their religion, their philosophy, their arts, or their alchemical knowledge. And on that, we have all these other societies and fraternities and, and things like that, but I don't see how <clears throat> something like the crest line, crystal line, and then when I put it to line work, when I give that line those forms and those rules, we kind of have some of our most famous symbols here. And then we also are able to show our most famous philosophical and scientific notions of the world with, again, just these, these literal, simple lines. We have the cross. We have the 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 uh, DNA helix. We have um, fractal emergence, which is really the crystalline structure in nature. And um, I, th you could say, hey, it's just a clever combination of things, and that that may be true. But again, if you just give our ancestors and our masters some respect whether English or Anglish is relatively new or a root language. Uh, there's just too much correlation here if, if we look at how alchemy has somehow been separated from religion and philosophy has somehow been separated from alchemy and uh, religion is, is just this, been turned into this supernatural thing. Uh, you know, and reading and writing were banned and, and it, it, it's, it does, none of it makes sense. There's just no reason to do that unless you want to control everybody and keep people divided. 
um, forms forms become principles and that's what we sort of have here this this derivative form which comes from this this ability to just use a cane a gimel or um, chopsticks you know whatever uh, in so many different ways and do so many different things with it that you know whether religion came first or philosophy came first art and chemistry as i just said with cooking and with communication and record keeping would have had to have been the first they would have had to have been and when i say arts i also mean language so uh, the spoken word and, and whatever it may be uh, defined as by you that whether you use the phrase the spoken word or just words in general utterances um, you know, I can go into some real deep stuff with AEIOU and all this other stuff, but it, it's not it, it's not going to help my abstract cause right now trying to go through this. But I think, again, this serves as a memory map for me. This isn't to try to sell you guys on a bunch of uh, abstract notions, but this is so I can put a lot of stuff down and get to it and come back to it and then, you know, sort it out. Entropy, chaos, and all this other stuff. And let me just go back here and just show you this because I think it'll uh, it, it could help my cause here before anybody calls blasphemy because I think that's that's one of the biggest issues too is this belief in this supernatural um, <clears throat> this this metaphysical somewhere else that's gonna punish us or something uh, you can look at this either way you can look at you know start it from this side and work your way backwards because this line here does coincide with this one and this one and this one and the same so it's kind of me just breaking down my thoughts into more approachable ways so various texts of various masters all attributed misattributed to one another separated divided um, it's not like there was a culture of alchemists every society had alchemists it's not like a culture of there were, there was just artists every society had artists it's not like there's just a culture of religious people. Religion people practice cooking, they practiced arts, they practiced all that stuff too. They just had a different way of referencing it, recording it, and separating it, or attributing it. You know, it, it, there's no reason why epiphany, inspiration, or cognizance can't be all part of the same phenomena. It's just those words, you know, an epiphany can often is most likely re, given to the religious uh, cognizance is given to the you know the neuroscience and inspiration is given to the artist but they're all just a sort of special lucidity that we all experience when we're involved in something when we're when we become masters at doing something um, so with that said I move on to language design and communication which is our knowledge accum accumulation and memory and arts, which is the crest line or the cross line, which is how we document and record the material world, or, which I think should be pretty obvious to people, I don't mean to sound condescending, I apologize, matter. Material and matter are sort of the same thing. They're derivatives. So, and then we have um, the micro and macro cosmos, right? We have microcosm and mi macrocosm, but it's really micro macro cosmos, fractal emergence, chaos, entropy, order, uh, the crystalline structure. And then we have us, you know, whether you want to call humans the greatest predator, the greatest gift, or, or the supreme design, uh, however you want to look at it. Uh, we have human beings. There may be there may be a, a, a dependency on a specific bloodline or a, a a special Christic line that is related to DNA. Uh, it, it's just too coincidental to have these all sort of these ancient old words ascribed to these very important philo philosophies and uh, abilities that we have and not not be able to attribute them to more common words 
that we use today. Uh, you know, there's, there's definitely a divide and conquer uh, thing going on. You know, whether you want to call it controllers, whatever. But I'm, I'm just, again, we're not. I'm not looking for who done it. Uh, I'm just looking to isolate that it did happen. You know, as I think I've said in, in one of the other videos, I'm. Uh, I, I, I can't isolate why it's happened. I'm just showing that it is happening for for whatever that's worth to the onlooker. Um, and then we have, you know, we have here the platonic solids too. We have the dodecahedron that emerges out of this. So real simply, the building segment of biology, material, man, all that stuff. I think you guys can look, you know, the building block. These are all phrases that are attributed to whether they're masons, alchemists, or religious people. And that sort of leads us back to ancient builders, the great builders, chief of the cornerstones. All of these are uh, referenced in various ways through different texts and uh, ancient history from the masters. Uh, here I'm just kind of starting to work out some other stuff, but uh, you know, this is definitely all, all memory arts, like I said at the beginning, whether you're an explorer, a maker, or a creator. And the creator being you know, the macro and the, the maker being the micro of that and then the explorer but um you know again we just i mean this is almost the sarah uh, uh, i'm mispronouncing it but uh, it's almost the beginnings of the seraph the uh kabbalah which is spelled wrong there um so then i come back over here crystalline christline equals crystalline alchemical physical strongest symbol i think structurally everybody anybody who's kind of had to build something knows that the arc is actually the most solid sound structure we could make by hand uh, in terms of it should be geodesic like this you know, an igloo uh, if it was made out of stone or an arc right with the keystone in it these are very profound building um, practices that we use uh, and I think that this should be taken seriously uh, and when we, to, when, we, when we look at knowledge sets and uh, mastery school knowledge whether you're a Mason or a Christian or a Jew or a Muslim or a Buddhist or whatever it's I think we just have to we have to simplify and reduce down a little bit be a little bit of a reductionist and just kind of let some correlations occur on their own. I think there's something to be said for that. I also think this is interesting that we can we can pull almost the perfect proportions for a keystone, depending on the number. Uh, so you got to learn how to make an arch, and what it's dependent on, and how much weight has to go above it. But I I just took some other occult type stuff, 33 points of light, put 33 lines in there, and you can almost get the exact proportions for a keystone. And that knowledge itself, those, those words have been, again, misattributed, I think, and, and re, you know, just flat out, they've been manipulated into other stuff, into more spiritual uh, demon stuff and all this other, other stuff. Over here, I get a little abstract. Um, I'm just trying to, to bring a, the, the cosmos into it a little bit better. I'm not going to go too far into it, I think. This might make a few people upset, but hey, you know what? I mean, look, 666-999, six, 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 nine, nine, nine. I, I hear this often, a couple typos, and I see it a lot. And I think if you just come back to what I said about this, this uh, coding that occurred where a line would be added to something, other letters would be flipped, and uh, all this other stuff, and then, you know, the, 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 it sounds like one thing, but it reads as another. These are literally the codes that secret societies use and secret fraternities. And wouldn't you know, if you just take one and make it a G, flip the other one around, you kind of got, right? It's just, it, it's simple. And it could be too simple, but um, this is a pretty important area of the world as well. 
and this symbol here, right? We know how important the G is to the Scottish Rite. So uh, we kind of have alphanumerical codes as well, but not in the way that we traditionally use them now. We have to look at them more as sigils. Um, and uh, I think for for the anthropologist that may be watching or, or whatever, we're you know we're we're looking at what might be called a birthing place. Well, of of what I don't know, but let's just call it a birthing place of something. And I think everybody knows that that means birthing. A circle is the birthing space. This is consciousness or the eye or instance or light. And uh, this is force, energy, mass. Uh, everybody has their own own version of it, um, but but they're all centrally, conceptually related to the same thing. Even the words I just used, centrally and conceptually. Uh, centrally, people think, oh, it just kind of means in the middle of all these topics, but it's we have this variation of these words that all relate to math and measurement. Figure, configure, figure it out. It also means like art, right? The human figure, figuring something out with a pencil. You know, well, I'm going to figure it out. I'm going to do math. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do it's. It's all the language is just sort of uh, overlaid a bunch of other um, emotional contexts, really, because it's it's usually when we unfortunately, I think the the religions that support the belief system of uh, demons flying around and this is not a not an insult to Christians because there's just so many different types of Christianity as well now and different philosophies that have evolved even as far as the 70s and 80s producing just some amazing um, religious theologians uh, who produce these really inspiring works that are still centrally basically philosophies and uh, not religions, they're just philosophies that support the religion. But a lot of them have uh, excommunicated <laughs> these ideas of uh, heaven and hell and instead are, are moving towards the individual being responsible for their own behavior. And so th there are some changes taking place, but there's just still so much of the fear put on top of stuff that these words are constantly misconstrued. Uh, so that's the short, uh, I don't know, an hour, hour and a half here, short presentation of what uh, I, I'm trying to, what I'm digging at here in this, these uh, old ideas of religion, philosophy, arts, and chemistry. And um, I hope that no one's been offended or, or insulted in any way. It's It's... There, I think from because I've I tend to read so many various different things. Um, some I should read more in depthly, but uh, when I go into sort of a scanning mode and I'm trying to run two or three books at a time, because I have something that I have to solve quickly. Uh, unfortunately, drawing is easier for me than it is uh, writing or. <clears throat> Uh, drawing what I see in the real world is easier for me than drawing what, uh, you know, making diagrams and trying to make things seem uh, tangible. It, it's, you know, it, it's not the same thing. So I have to, uh, and then also the, the, the amount of words I absorb, <coughs> excuse me, depending on, uh, fortunately that's all written in English and, and uh, I can, uh, make these correlations I think it's it's important to recognize at the tail end of this uh, as I talk it's just not it's not meant to be offensive so you can't take that offense it's it's just not there I mean you can be discouraged you can be upset but you can't blame the intention nor can you blame the person behind the intention because I don't have those intentions there I just want to state that uh, but I think you know, and, and you don't have to, I mean, you can completely disregard this. There should be enough holes as well. I think there's a few holes in, in any number of these things, but I'm not going to go back and listen to this just yet. Uh, I, I think I've covered what I want to cover for now because anything else would be, uh, would lead people off a cliff and into a tangential 
downward spiral, uh, another very important uh, symbol. Uh, you know, this is another example here. That it's not the golden calf. It's it's most likely the golden halves. I mean, it, that only makes sense to me in the context of the presentation that I've made. But um, there, there's a lot of other things that can be learned um, on your own. Simply just just by doing some geometry work. And when I say geometry, I don't mean. Uh, mathematics I mean just getting a pencil and paper and really getting down getting off the keyboard and just doodling a little bit and uh, looking at the letters and symbols that we all use and these words that we all use I think they're tied together in more implicit ways where the form becomes a principle and the principles are extrapolated into laws emotions beliefs and understandings and if we just step back and look at how we use words in English that may come from Italian or Latin or Greek or uh, Scottish or Russian or Ruin or Chinese or whatever it is. I mean, the fact that we can we somehow get a translation of, you know, I don't, I don't know what the Hebrew word is for Hebrew. Does anybody know what that is? Because as far as I understand, we're using an English word to describe a different language. Is there a Hebrew word for Hebrew? If not, that should be an indicator to everybody that there's something going on with the language overall. And, and you know, uh, just to tie back in and close this off, the witch stuff. I mean, we have spells and spelling, and everybody has sort of made that correlation before. But we use these things for a reason. That's that, that's that negative ban reading and writing and uh, the devilish scratch and, and all that stuff, the spells and spelling. I mean, that's how powerful the arts are. That when we began language, we probably didn't know what we were doing, and we could have, you know, the, the whole the whole premise is is that it just spontaneously erupted, and, and it didn't, it couldn't have. We would have had to have started, in my mind, with ESP or telepathy as a bunch of Neanderthals, you know, running around like a school of fish, reacting to vibration and uh, you know energy waves that we send out to each other, just like fish do or sonar, and uh, the arts and chemistry being tool making and device making uh, as well as cooking uh, and and then that sort of evolving into uh, religion and philosophy and then throughout all that we sort of lose these and we lose this or uh, a larger group comes in and says you know what it's all devilish and you can't use it anymore and look at that the no symbol is actually a line in a circle that's crazy all right, uh, I hope I can get some more of these videos out, but I'm most likely going to go right back into the ESP stuff from the NSA and CIA. And I'll come back at another time, maybe in a week or two, and try some of the other um, mind maps and graphics that I put together. And, uh, you know, I don't know how, again, I don't know how much traction this video is going to get, but if there's any comments or questions, post them in the bottom and I'll try to answer them as honestly as I can. Uh, still recognizing that uh, this is still a big abstraction. All right, thanks.